Cool, welcome to another episode of Jim's Allotment Garden. It's really cold today. It's about four degrees, but because it's so windy, um, the, the you know the wind chill factor is really cold. The wind vane's finished. I'm going to show you later on in the uh, the video um, all the last stages of putting it all together and painting, etc. And then actually um, the wind vane in place. But to start with, I'm going to show you the um, um, Mother Nature. Don't fight with Mother Nature. Garden Chemistry Part Two. Um, and then I'll show you all the rest of the, uh, the weather vane bits and bobs. So, welcome to another episode of Jim's Allotment Garden. Okay, so last time on um, Don't Fight With Mother Nature, Garden Chemistry, um, I explained to you um, that, that in the ground um, you need um, three, uh, four main things, nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, sulphur. Nitrogen's good for leaves, potassium's good for roots, um, sorry, potassium's good for fruit, I made that mistake last time, and phosphate's good for roots, sulphur's good for leaves. So there are other things that you need in the ground, and as I explained last time, um, you um, Plants and humans are very similar, or animals are very similar, we need the same things. And obviously one of the building blocks um, or chemicals, elements that we need to grow our bodies properly is calcium. We get calcium from a whole, whole um, um, range of foods etc. Food, um, plants in exactly the same way need the same food. Now one of the richest forms of um, calcium that you can put into the ground um, are eggshells. Now obviously we're all using eggs um, and eggshells are basically calcium. Now there are other there are other um, sources of um, calcium, things like lime, if you put lime on the ground that's that's calcium um, or it's a calcium compound. Problem is with lime it will change the pH of your um, ground. The pH of your ground is something I'll come on to but um, most plants like an acidic soil, uh, my garden is actually, uh, my, my allotment is, is around six, so it's quite acidic because I put quite a lot of chicken manure on it, etc. Um, if you put lime on there, it will, it will increase the, uh, the pH, um, make it more alkali um, or, or, or basic as, as it's also called. Um, but an eggshell is, is, is neutral. So eggshells have got two main uses. One, they're a very rich um, form of um, calcium and you can do one or two things with eggshells you can either just break them up or put them in the ground or just put them in the ground they'll break up anyway when you dig it um, and then they'll break down in the soil and, and, and give your plants calcium. Calcium aren't one of the main four. Calcium is a um, um, a substance, um, it's what your teeth are made from and basically the um, Calcium is very good for root development, um, stem growth, and um, it has another property as well where it, it, it opens up the soil and allows oxygen to get into the soil. Oxygen is important for the bacteria and the microbes and everything to break things down, so that's also important. And obviously plants need oxygen as well. Um, but um, calcium is really good for this in the soil, so never throw an eggshell away. Um, always have a, a little composting bin or whatever in your, in your kitchen or, or just outside. If you use your eggs, just put the shells straight in the ground. You don't need to compost them as such. You can put them directly into the ground and they'll, they'll break down in the ground and, 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 and provide a rich form of calcium for your plants so that your, uh, the root growth and the, uh, the stem growth and the oxygen concentration within the soil will be high. Your plants will be healthy. So even though calcium is not one of the main four, it's not nitrogen, phosphate, potassium or sulphur, it's also very important, and as and as I discuss more about um, the you know the sort of chemistry garden, I'll, I'll I'll come on to calcium again because it has got other properties. The second use for cal uh, for, for eggshells is um, 
it's really good as, as a deterrent um, for um, slugs and snails and, and stuff like that. Now what you can do is either break them up into your hand, um, and if you don't like touching them, put them in a bag, break them up inside the bag um, and put them on the ground as it is. Um, and when the slugs and snails crawl over the, the eggshells, the eggshells get stuck to the, um, uh, the underneath um, of the um, um, gastropod, the snail, the slug. And obviously that's its sharp edges and stuff like that will be a deterrent so the slugs will turn around and go, oh, I'm not going on that and it'll go off. Um, what you can do uh, to make that easier is if, if you've got a lot of eggshells, um, and I wouldn't suggest you do this with just a few, because obviously, you know, when you've got your oven on, um, you know, when you're cooking something else, you, 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 you know, your dinner or whatever, put the eggshells on a, a baking tray, you can break them up or just leave them whole, and the heat of the oven will break down the calcium within the, um, with the eggshell, and it'll break down into more of a sort of crumbly dust, and then put that on the ground um, as it is, um, that way so, but, but if you don't want to go through putting them in the oven and stuff like that, you can just put them straight on the ground, they will break down on the ground anyway. Um, but uh, if you have got a load of eggshells that you've just made a load of cakes or, or, or whatever, um, whilst you're baking your cake, put all the eggshells on a, on a baking tray, bob them in the bottom of the oven, and um, as soon as you've finished your cakes, take them back out of the oven, let them cool down, and then just break them up with your hands and put them on the soil, and that will, and that will um, enable them to break down a lot quicker, and their calcium and other minerals will go into the soil a lot quicker. So um, that's all about eggshells. Um, Last time we talked about bananas. Bananas skins are fantastic. They're rich in all sorts of things that are good for the garden. They, they really are one of the richest um, forms of minerals that you can use on there. Um, so, you know, I, I explained that bananas are rich in, um, you know, potassium, phosphor, calcium, sulphur, magnesium, and also sodium, which I'll come on to later on. Um, when they're decaying, um, the um, the gas that they give off, I've, I've forgotten last time, I know I wrote it at the bottom, but um, it's, eth it's actually ethylene, which is a hydrocarbon gas, that's what makes the, the, the fruit ripe, etc. And um, that was one of them instances, I don't know if you've ever had that, where you've had, in a good way, you have this little voice in your head where i just finished videoing and, the, and you said, it was ethylene. It, it's one of them things like, you know, you're driving to work and you get to work and just as you pull up to the gate, it, it goes, you've forgotten your laptop or you've forgotten to put your trousers on, or something like that. But uh, anyway, the gas that it gives off is, is um, ethylene, and that's um, um, a gas which will, which will make your tomatoes or strawberries or whatever ripen if they're not quite rotten as, as, as quick as you would like, so that's the use of banana. We also talked about um, oranges and the lemonine, um, which is the substance inside um, any citrus fruit, so uh, lemons, oranges, da da da. That, that will um, cause um, aphids to suffocate, so if you wipe that on your plants, it'll suffocate. So that's just a quick summary of what we did last time. If you've got a lot of aphids, um, that brings me on to the, um, uh, the next tip. Um, there's one way that you can organically kill aphids. Now, you need to be careful when you do this. Um, so, um, uh, this, this, this bit of advice most certainly comes with some caution. Rhubarb, um, apart from the fact it's a nice um, herb, and it, again it's not a fruit like bananas, it's a herb. Um, the leaves on, on rhubarb is filled um, with something called dicarbolic acid. Dicarbolic acid is incredibly poisonous. Um, it'll kill you and I just as much as it will kill aphids, so you need to be really careful with this. But if you have got a lot of aphid infestation and you want to kill them off organically, what you can do is get the leaves off rhubarb, um, chop them up finely, wear gloves, wash your hands after you've done this. Um, what you don't want to do is get any um, diabolic acid in, in your mouth or whatever. Um, chop it up as fine as you possibly can, put it into a, um, a, a bottle with some water, give it a good shake, leave it leave it in the bottle for a few days, a few weeks, let it start to break down, the dicarbolic acid will come out of the will, will come out of the, uh, the rhubarb leaves and into the water. You can then spray that onto the plants. This will kill the aphids. It'll kill them outright. Um, when you do this, don't breathe it in. Um, 
so you need to be careful doing this. In Victorian times, this was a very popular way of um, creating um, um, insecticide. And in in Victorian times in the, in the UK, there was a lot of roses grown. Um, it was a very popular flower. Roses are incredibly prone to aphids, black fly, green fly, um, and they will absolutely infest um, roses. What they used to do was grow rhubarb purely for the leaves. They used to get the leaves, chop them up like I've just explained, and they used to boil them to get the dicarbolic acid to come out of the leaves. The fumes that come off when you're boiling um, rhubarb leaves contains dicarbolic acid. So I do not suggest you do this. Put it in a bottle, keep it contained and, 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 and shake it up. It's most certainly not as good as boiling it because you don't get as much out of the leaves. But if you are going to try to boil it, most certainly do this outside. Get yourself a camping stove, keep everybody away from it and just simmer it down in the, uh, in the um, uh, in a little bit of water, obviously don't use too much water, chop the leaves up, boil them in the uh, the water and then obviously all the diabolic acid will come out of the leaves again uh, from the rhubarb, just stew them and then um, squeeze the leaves, get as much out as you possibly can and then spray that on your tomatoes or you know whatever um, has got the aphids on. That will most certainly kill all the aphids dead, this is an organic way of doing it So it's and it's also cost you nothing if you've got your own rhubarb. If you do that, the dicarbolic acid will be on the tomatoes, will be on anything else. Um, I personally wouldn't spray it on anything I'm intending to eat. Um, so I, I wouldn't use this method on um, tomatoes or, 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 or sort of whatever, or kale, that's another one that, get, that gets covered in white fly. Um, things like roses, obviously things you're not going to eat, plants. Um, I used to grow, when I was younger, I used to grow um, thousands, and I mean thousands, of fuchsias. I, I used to be quite a fuchsia specialist. And I used to grow um, something like two and a half thousand new plants every year and, and sell them when I was kind of 13, 14, 15 years old. And um, that's why I used to earn my pocket money. And uh, fuchsias are very prone to uh, white fly and green fly. And this is obviously a method you can spray on um, the uh, the plants to um, to basically to kill all the aphids off. Um, most certainly, if you have sprayed any on anything, uh, you most certainly need to not breathe any of it in. Um, so I would suggest you put a mask on or something like that, or most certainly don't get it on your skin. If you have been spraying, most certainly wash your arms and you know any exposed skin um, that you've had um, whilst you've been spraying, and. Um, if you have sprayed it on any of your tomatoes, I don't believe that the plant will actually absorb the dicarbolic acid. It'll just sit on the, the sort of the skin of the fruit or, or, or the plant. Um, obviously, wash any fruit that you've got there. So, obviously, when I was um, last year when I had the tomatoes here, I sprayed um, a Bordeaux mixture onto the um, plants and also the tomatoes. What you need to do, if you ever spray anything like that onto fruit that you're going to eat, you most certainly need to wash them thoroughly to get all the uh, the nasties off there. There's a lot of like things like copper sulfate and stuff in Bordeaux mixture, which is poisonous again. Um, so you need to make sure you wash all of that off um, thoroughly. So if you do use any of these sprays, make sure you don't breathe it in. That's, that's, that's very important. Um, make sure you don't get it on your skin. If you do get it on your skin, wash your skin off um, quickly. If you wash your skin, wash with cold water. Don't wash with hot water. Um, because um, if you put hot water on your skin, your skin pores will open and the whatever it is will go into the skin pores. If you wash your hands with cold water, the skin pores will stay closed and it'll all come off and it, and it won't absorb into your skin. So um, that's another tip for when you're cooking. Um, cooking with garlic or with leeks. Leeks are closer to garlic than onion. Um, and you've got the smell on your hands um, and you want to wash it off and chilli as well. If you're cutting the chilli up and you get the chilli juice all over your hands um, you don't want to go to the toilet because trust me you only do that once. Uh, but uh, the best way to get it off your hands is to wash your hands in cold water. So just get a bit of washing up liquid, cold water like that. Your skin's your uh, the, the, the pores on your skin won't open and it'll get rid of all the smell. So if you're ever cutting up garlic and, you, and your hands are covered in garlic oil 
um, cold water and some soap, that'll get rid of it completely off your hands. If you do it with hot water, the pores of your skin, you can try this yourself, you do it with hot water and um, the pores of your skin will open, the, the oils and the smells etc from the garlic will go into your hands. After you've washed your hands in hot water, dry them off, smell your hands, they'll smell, still smell of garlic. Do it with cold water, they won't. So, good tip. If you've ever if you've ever got anything on your hands you want to get rid of, use cold water to wash them. And that goes for your arms, your face and everything else as well. So uh, that's, the, that's the tips that I can give you for um, garden chemistry. I know I've sort of sort of gone off a bit on uh, washing your hands with garlic and stuff like that. But uh, um, do be careful. If you, if you do um, use the dicarbolic acid out of um, rhubarb leaves and you are going to boil it, please be really careful because dicarbolic acid is incredibly poisonous. Um, in exactly the same way as it kills the aphids, it, it will damage you. So um, I, I strongly suggest you don't boil it up, just put it in a bottle and, and shake it up and then spray it on any plants that you've got. Um, but obviously be careful if you're in a confined space like a greenhouse, um, I'd be really careful. If I was you, I'd take the infected plant outside, spray it outside in the atmosphere so it'll, it'll dissipate out of the way, and then put the plant back in the greenhouse. Don't go in the greenhouse and start spraying it because you're breathing it in. So um, that's the best advice I can give you. So that's second part of um, Don't Fight With Mother Nature Garden Chemistry. Um, there'll be a lot more coming up, but what I'm going to do is break it into sort of digestible bits um, so you can sort of build up the knowledge as I have done over the years. So that was it. Oh, what about the wind vane? What about the wind vane? Oh, what about the weather vane? What about the weather vane? Okay, so we're now going to finish off the top part of the uh, the weather vane. And if you remember, the last time we made this, which is going to be sitting on the top, so that's going to go into the middle of the uh, the wheel. The bottom part of it is also going to fit into the the tail, which is going to show the direction. So, and you also saw me make the the north, south, east, and west. Um, signs. Um, so what I've done basically is um, I've welded on a piece of um, this is actually uh, M6 threaded bar which is just a bit of scrap that I managed to get hold of and the way I did it just to very quickly recap so, I can, so you can see what I was doing I basically used the lines on this tile clamped it on there with the, the earth for the welder and then align that along the line so I know that's straight and then from the lines on here I can see where the middle of the letter is and then all I've done is I've used a bit of scrap metal just to space it up slightly so it's in the middle of this bar and I've tacked it on that side and then immediately turned it over and tacked it on the, the other side and I've done that for all four letters so I didn't show you that on the video because I thought you know, that was reasonably obvious while I was doing that so now what needs to be done is to weld the letters onto the um, the centre part which is obviously going to sit in the middle of the wheel. Now the way I've um, derived how long this this piece needs to be is obviously that's going to be um, sitting somewhere like that in the middle obviously it's, it's, it's going to be on the bar so obviously I needed to make sure that that missed the, uh, the wheels because this bit's going to be spinning around this bit's obviously going to be stationary so obviously from the middle of there I went out and then as you can see I've got about uh, about two inches of clearance there plus this is going to be slightly higher anyway so all I needed to do was make sure that the that the letters obviously weren't going to uh, come into contact with the uh, the wheel there you know it was far enough away so the next part is to obviously weld the letters um, onto the uh, the middle bit and the way I've done this is I've got the um, the centrepiece that we made last time uh, when we were making this bit, I, I know I've done the pole since, but um, this is the this is the centre bit that was in the bit before in, in the um, part six, um, um, January part six of the video. So, um, so I've got this clamped in the vise with this piece of wood here. I know that this is all level within the vise. Obviously, I've got that nice and tight in the vise. And what all I've got is a a nut and washer here to give me a bit of spacing. And what I've done is I've measured out with a pot of tin and a number of tiles just to space it up where the letters need to be. So I know if I sit the letter on there, yeah, and on the and rest it on the bolt like that, then sorry if I bring the tin very slightly closer, like that, 
then I know that that is the right spot for it to be welded obviously between the two the blades like that if you can see there so what I'll do is I'll hold that on weld it on there and without moving the tin what I'm going to then going to do is obviously I've got the end for the north then I'm going to um, turn it round for the um, the south now because this is this is the way I'm thinking because the south as you can see is the same size letter as the north but can you see the bottom reference point here isn't isn't quite the same so I'm, I'm going to use the fact that that tins in the same place like that to make sure that I've got the south in the right spot as, as, as well as the north and, and I can weld that in place there again obviously the north will be pointing over there at that point and then after I've welded the north and the south on, um, I'll then, in exactly the same way, turn this round again, and then I'll be able to weld on the uh, the east and the west, and obviously the west as well. Uh, the, the the letter there, as you can see, the side of it goes in, so that's also going to sit just just outside of the tin there as well. Get it in the middle there, and I can weld the the west in there. Um, so I'll do that now. Okay, so there you have the top. So I've got north, south, east and west. And you can't believe how many times I've actually said to myself whilst I was doing this, never eat shredded wheat to make sure I got them in the right order. And inadvertently what I'd actually done was welded the north on upside down, which is not too much of a problem because from this side, obviously it would have been the right side. But I don't know if you've noticed, but I always walk down the allotment on the right-hand side. So if I walk down the right-hand side of the allotment they're all going to be the right way around so I'm going to have obviously north south as I walk down this side of it and then if I look up from there I'm going to have the the if I can find it there's the east over there and obviously the the west is going to be the same way either way so that's what it's actually going to look like so as you can see there's the bottom bit um, I've just held it back but obviously this 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 rotates so it's independent I've just got a bit of um, a tin of paint there just just stop it from turning there's the there's the rotor, so that's going to spin round in the centre like that. And then there's your north, south, east and west bit at the top of the spike on the top. There is going to be, obviously that aluminium thing is going to go here, so it'll be like a little hat sort of thing there, and there'll be another one here. This bit, when it's all together, as you can see there's a bit of thread there, that's going to be wound all the way down, so this cup will be a lot closer to this, it's going to be probably uh, about an inch and a half closer so that's going to drop by about an inch and a half onto there so it'll be a lot closer to this than it is at the moment as you can see it's it's already reasonably close okay so i've dismantled it again and i've um give it a coat of uh um primer and i've just painted the uh round where the welds are joining onto the letters as i say what i'll do is where they actually join the letter I'll uh, paint that bit silver to basically hide the weld. Okay, so I'm just fitting the uh, the last cup onto the um, the anemometer, and basically what I've basically what I've done is I've obviously got all of the discs ready as you've as you've seen, and basically what you need to do, if I can just press it against myself, not easy with the camera, as you can see at the end there, I've got two um, V's cut in the um, the aluminium. That tells me where it needs to go, and then all I do then is hold it on the back of the uh, the arm that needs to go on. Whilst I'm holding it in place like that I just quickly drill through the first hole here and then fasten the uh, the first bolt on. So I'll, I'll show you that now. Okay so as soon as the first bolt's in then you can see this bottom part here which is overlapping. I've aligned that up with the top of the the piece there and, and I know that the, the top piece is obviously going going in, sorry like this one here. So that's aligned with the also with the um, with the top, so that the end of, of uh, so this one's upside down in comparison. The end of this one basically is at the bottom. So um, I know that I've got that much overlap all the way along the um, the actual blade. Now I've, because I've got the first one in, I can now work out obviously where the second and the third are. So all I need to do now is drill through to the other side of the blade and just place another bolt here, and then the same again here. OK, and as soon as you've got the last bolt in, you'll have this natural little bit of curl here at the end. And basically all I do is uh, put my hand on the inside just to support it and just tap that with the hammer 
so it goes round, so it's kind of smooth like that. Then you'll see that the hole that's drilled in the middle um, allows you just to sort of bend it down so you get the proper sort of cup shape on the end of each one. And that's the rotor finished. Now, to protect the, um, the bearings in the middle, obviously, this is the top of the bearing set here. And this was originally a wheel, so it's a bit, would have been on its side. But as you can imagine, if the water runs down here on, and sits on top of this bearing here, it's going to work its way in because obviously this will be spinning. Um, so I need to protect that. And what I've done is I've just quickly made like a little um, top hat, if you like, just a, well, it looks more like a little Japanese hat actually, which will, that will just sit on there just to cap off the top. Now all, all that is, is uh, a piece of, um, a circular piece of aluminium with a hole cut in the middle, uh, about 30 mm. Obviously you need to make the hole bigger than the hole you want to end up with. And all I've done is I've just brought, exactly the same way as in the cup, I've just brought those ends together like that. And whilst it's in the position I want it, I've drilled a hole through there and I've just put a single uh, pop rivet in there. Obviously it's going to be held together in the uh, the middle anyway with a, a wash at the underneath it and above it. So it'll all be sort of screwed down like that anyway. So all you really need on the edge here is just one pop rivet just to hold it in place. Then when the water comes down, the water will run down here, then off and then straight onto the wheel rather than going inside the bearing here. So that's going to protect the bearing. This second one that I've just shown you, this will be underneath here and that will protect the bearing on the tail. So there'll be one there and then one just underneath um, this wheel here. So that will kind of sit in sort of there, if you like. Um, and that will protect the bearing which is on top of the, um, the tail. OK, so just quickly, because it's quite windy at the top, what I'll do is I'll explain how it's uh, gone together. So we've got uh, the weather, sorry, the, the north, south, east, bit west there, which is going down onto a washer, which is going onto the cups that I showed you. Um, there, so basically the water is going to come down here, roll off and not go into the bearing at the top and it will flow down, the water will flow down here to the second cup and obviously the bearings for the tail are at the bottom there, so this bit here as you can see is bolted between um, the, so it's slightly, slightly wonky, there you go um, so it will come off here, flow down here and then rather than going into the bearings it will then drip off and then go and obviously there's clearance there's clearance there, um, and there's obviously this clearance at the top because there's nothing around there. So that's 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 how I stop water going into the bearing set. So I bet you're all dying to see the um, the weather vane in place. So I'll take you out there now, and uh, you'll be able to see it in its uh, in all its glory. So there she is. Um, it's it's taken a little bit of adjustment. It is reasonably windy today, um, but that's the uh, the weather vane. Now, as you can see, I've just shown you the bits and bobs on the bottom. I decided to paint the bottom bit um, with, a, with, with, a, with a checker design, as you can see. I'll just come over here so you can see it a bit better. Um, there is 190 squares on there, which are all 30 millimetres. And trust me, that took ages to paint. And uh, I wouldn't recommend you do it. It got quite boring towards the end of it. Uh, I just want to say a, a, a few thank yous. Um, the first one is a big thank you to Roger for uh, donating the bike frame and wheel which um, went to use the, um, uh, 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 to make the weather vane, so thank you to Roger. I'd also like to say a big thank you to um, Bethany and Jamie, my son and daughter, who also helped me paint. Jamie painted all the top bit and I'll be painting these squares here and Bethany also helped me to paint these squares and Jamie also painted the underneath of the uh, the rotary wheel so without their help it wouldn't have been as easy to make it but um, there she is, I've just noticed the uh, the north, south, east, west bits have spun around uh, actually north is kind of that way so uh, I must uh, need to do a little bit of adjustment but obviously um, for the first few days I'm just going to leave it up there and just let it get uh, let the bearings um, sort of loosen up a bit and then I'll uh, get up there and adjust it. Um, just as a um, point of interest, I, I've actually uh, drilled a hole through this bit here and I've actually um, made it so it doesn't actually come off the post at all, so if anybody tries to pinch it, it'll stop it. One thing I have noticed is, most certainly with the wind today, um, the, uh, it, it's a bit sort of wobbly at the top and what I might do is um, put a um, stronger post in 
Um, I'll, I'll see how I go with this one, but I might actually beef the post up a bit or uh, put some supporting wires coming down or something. I don't know. I'll have to have a think about that. But it's most certainly safe. Um, I had a question about, um, I think it was from Ken. He said, how heavy is it? I measured it last night and it's actually 6.7 kilos, which is a lot heavier than I thought. I guess it was going to be around four, but it's actually 6.7 kilos, the weight of the, uh, the whole thing. Um, now the, the size of the post and all the rest of it, I'm reasonably confident it's going to be safe up there. If it does fall, it's, it's not going to hit the greenhouse or hopefully nobody else. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not going to fall off there, so I don't think um, I'll have a problem. But um, it's been a nice project to do and I think it's um, a nice addition to the allotment. So there's the weather vane. So I hope this edition of Jim's Lomit Garden has been some use to you. Please do put your comments subscribe below. Thank you to everybody that's subscribed so far. And I shall see you on the next episode of Jim's Lomit Garden. Thank you. Bye-bye.